I mean, I met, I met the Novatop people because I discovered CLT about 10 years ago and I went on a bit of a campaign to find it and it took me five years to find, to find Novatop here in Cape Town. Um, and, and the relationship is, it's, it's nothing special. We, we, we've chatted over the years. We don't, I don't work with them or anything like that. I just, I've just spent more time talking to them about what they do than anybody else. There's some shade over here if anybody wants to see the shade. Um, and I'm not really here to talk about this project, although this project has been designed to work in CLT. Um, and but I'm just really here to talk more about the process of my experience of the relationship of working with, with a company who have a technology that is resolved with experience and then the sort of design loop feedback. Okay, that, that's the sort of the feedback loops that I have through the design process of, of my experience. My, my attraction to, to modular prefabrication sort of comes from two things. One, I spent the first five years of my career in the sort of early 90s, it's mid, mid to late 90s and early 2000s building my own projects. So that's kind of where I started. And because I kind of didn't have any money, I started building things out of wood because I didn't need much machinery. I, my first projects were far northern KwaZulu Natal. There was no electricity. So I was building with hand tools and there was a sawmill up the road and I had a bucky and some hand tools and we built camps with the local community and then bought a generator and then I had a drill. You know, it was cool. Um, but <clears throat> what I, my attraction to timber and I built with it all my life, but not exclusively, is that it's kind of accessible and the logic is understandable. So when I'm working with people who aren't hugely skilled, people kind of get it. You know, it's very direct. If you want to put a plank up, you put a plank up. The instructions are simple. And if you can keep the architectural form quite simple, there's a natural understanding. Okay, so there's a certain kind of democratization about timber that I, that I quite enjoy. You know, there's a certain democracy in, in the accessibility of skill and understanding and process that I, that I, that I quite like. The problem is, if you start trying to do things that are more modern or complex, then we start going into a technology around timber that is quite foreign to us. We are not culturally timber builders. So we'll make a bed or a chicken hockey or a, you know, or a, you know, northern KwaZulu Natal. They make these walls where they kind of weave laths between poles and then pack them with stone, and it's quite beautiful, but it's. It's a very sort of simple and direct way of building, but it doesn't deal with what modern architecture has to deal with in terms of thermal stability, water protection, all that kind of stuff. So there's, <coughs> so, and we, we don't have a, a sort of people who really understand it. So one of the problems that I think like a guy like James from Xlam has is he, he makes beautiful, makes beautiful CLT, but who's the builder? And He's got solutions and that's good, but we've got a long way to go before we are, and I mean, there are a few really good timber builders in South Africa, uh, particularly, you know, Cape Town through the Southern Cape Coast. But they working in technology that, you know, I feel is, is, uh, is, is kind of thousands of years old. And it's not like it's a bad technology, but it doesn't really take advantage of what modern mass timber construction brings okay modern mass timber construction is really massive pieces of wood you can't burn them they're just too big the fire chief in vancouver says clt buildings are much safer to rescue people out of than brick and steel buildings the main thing is because the building stays up longer because the the steel gets to 300 degrees and it completely structurally fails timber gets charred and it stays up so, and then, you know, the other thing about mass timber that I really like is on, a, on an environmental level is it's super economical. I mean, it's super efficient. South African sawmills are achieving between 40 and 50% recovery rates. 100 cubes come in, 50 cubes of planks come out, sometimes less. The sawmills that are happening in Europe are getting 80 to 80% 80 recovery and even higher. So if you're dealing with CLT, firstly, they're cutting down the trees when they're small. So the tree is reaching its peak on its carbon sequestration. As trees get older and older, they sequester less carbon. 
So the tree is <coughs> cut down at its peak of how much carbon it's sequestered. Secondly, when a tree is this big, your rings are smaller, so that when you look at the cross sections through this wood, but you'll see that the, the curve of the grain is really close, okay, which gives you structural stability. So the rings are, you know what I mean, like the, the perimeter of the, of the tree is this, so you, anyway, you get what I mean. So the wood is actually more stable. Uh, 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 um, It's more stable because crown cut timber is less stable and they're very selective so you also look at the CLT and it's kind of lacquer because they've got a thin layer and a thin layer so less of the prime timber is used in the outer layers and the less prime timber sits in the middle okay so they're getting there's an efficiency in the way the thing is put together and over top CLT has surface finishes that are better than other timbers so you can use it as a finishing material a lot of other CLTs and that's what it's for is its core structural material it's basically a structural diaphragm wall kind of thing solid taking forces in all directions so and then your other in your other engineered timbers like long veneer laminations and short strand laminations are very they, they, they're very structurally predictable but they can achieve massive recovery rates like beams that look like OSB but actually they're made out of big flakes of wood like this that are aligned and put together but you can imagine this is a tree trunk being smashed up into pieces quite specifically and then glued back together. You've got 5% glue in this thing and the rest of it's tree and very little is being thrown away. So your recovery rates are much higher, which is really nice with, this, with engineered timbers. So the process of, of my experience and this year, last year and this year, we first started dealing with this process of working out design with, um, with Novatop. Like, what is the process? How does it work? You know, you're coming up with a concept of a building. There it is. You kind of like a project like this. After many deliberations, it's my own project. Um, this is my house. It's on the street. It's very lacquer. The house takes up a third of the site. I'm zoned GR4. I can put nine residential units on this site. So I'm allowed to densify. And this is in sort of Berea and Durban, Gravel, it's the Florida Road. <laughs> And I want to develop this building <clears throat> in the middle of the site. This is a back service lane. Um, and so this building is kind of going to be tucked around the back. It's not a building that's there to activate a public street. It's, it's set back. It's tucked behind my house. You can see in the cross section it doesn't get any higher. But because my house was built in 1915 or 1914, it's got nearly a 4-meter ground floor and then the top and a steeply pitched roof and I can fit four stories here where there's two <coughs> well and a basement and a roof so you, you can see how the two buildings relate <coughs> I've also chosen at this point not to go into a special consent situation in any way I'm within my zoning I'm within my huts I'm allowed to develop this envelope I'm within my allowable bulk my neighbors don't have a choice okay well done. <laughs> Good start. <laughs> and I wanted to do other things, you know. I wanted to, to to put it along the lane and activate the lane. If I could get all of these properties up the road, we yeah. could build a news down yeah. here. It would be yeah. super cool. Yeah. But Urban Lime, who've like done swooshed their arm through Cape Town and they've swooshed their arm through through Florida Road, have decided the way they're developing this side, and it's they're not going to activate backwards. So. Orientation works, north is up there, the building sits, you know, quite nicely on the site. But now, so the concept behind this building is an uninterrupted floor plate of about 100, it's, it's a 6 meter by 6 meter grid, so it's 18 by 6, it's a 108 square meter floor plate with a detached stairwell, okay? It's an uninterrupted floor plate. I want to allow anything to, all the major city expansion that we've done in South Africa for the last... 25 years has got nothing to do with the future of this country. It's purely economics. It's purely investment. And it's quite unfortunate. I mean, that's my take on it. But we'll see how useful those buildings are shortly. I mean, all the old uh, kind of commercial buildings or industrial buildings in the observatory and Woodstock, they're all lend themselves far but huge differential in terms of their usage they got yeah. residential they got but shops the whole thing they work the, well. i mean the only difficult thing about turning an office building into a residential building is you've got to feed a whole bunch more shit perhaps down yes. the thing yeah. but that's yeah. all you've got to do yeah. you know it, it's it's you know but the, but the fact is our cbds are dense they 
they're usable. You know, you might have to smack a, 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 an air core down the middle, but it's just, yeah, these sort of big sites and buildings plonked in the middle and massive parking on them. It's crazy. I mean, it's... Is this building a, a work in progress or is it underway or built? No, no, Your. this building is exactly <laughs> where it is. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and just as a kind of thumb suck, what, what are you hoping to build it for as a building rate? I know it's okay, so difficult. It's what I want to build it for, so I'm going to be pretty involved. I, it's, a, it's 140 square meters per floor. I'd like to spend a million rand a level. So I'm hoping to do it for under... So there's four levels here. So I'm sort of... I'm hoping to work this thing out at about five bar. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's only, so it's, so it's 108 square meters inside and it's another 45 square meters of verandas per level, but I'm throwing in the basement, you know, this level here, there's a bit of retaining work to do on the side boundaries, um, like there, you know. But then you'll have a shell essentially and then. No, that'll be finished. Will that be finished? Yeah. I mean, but you, you mentioned that they're sort of multi-use spaces. People can use them as studios or they can use them as yeah. resident. If they want to then have a home in there, then there's got to be a certain so, amount of, of additional work done or not. Okay, so it's my property. Yeah. All right. I'm, I'm going to do my, like, I don't have five bar, okay? Let's yeah. face it. But what I want to do is work out how to construct the financial deal that either get somebody some rich friend to bridge the finance to a point where it's built and finished and then I can rent it and then bond it yeah. settle their debt at the long shot you know I've been kind of doing okay so if I need to if I need five million rand to do the build can I come up with a million and a half myself put that down as surety to the bank bond on that ie pre-sales yeah. and then build the building and then put it out into the rental market but it's, it's risky you know, it's all pretty ballsy stuff. Uh, you know, it'll be quite fun if the first CLT building built in South Africa is three stories. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because this is the thing. It's like yeah. houses, eh, you know, really. They're kind of cool, but, you know, what are they for? Big plots, standalone houses. It's not, it's not, we need, you know, I was, uh, this, these inner city suburbs of Durban, I, I can't equate it. I can kind of equate it to Joburg a bit. You know, I can look at the parks. You look at the parks and you look at how much densification there is. Randlord houses go down and these multi, you know, in Durban on the Berea, grand old houses, the guys eventually just let them get so dilapidated that a mile for kind of give up. And then you get these eight story drive up. The guys have garages all the way up the building. It's big spiraling <coughs> parkades. And then apartments in front. It's like, Crazy. but they're like 15 of them on the Durban Berea and it's we have to look at the densification of our suburbs you know we can't just sprawl out we've got it we've got this property of mine can support five families in any other country in the world you know it's just like what are we doing you know these bungalows on sites they're like farms actually it's very funny I bought this house like 15 years ago and I, and I said to my wife at the time uh, I said to, we've just bought our farm you know, because it's so big and there's so much there. These properties are massive. What are you doing? And it's, I mean, I know we like living that way, but it's kind of, it's, it's heavy, eh? You know, like the, the pipe works and what, what we maintain and run to support this many, this few people, these, you know, 20, 10, 15 units per hectare kind of densities that we have in inner city areas. Like, I don't mind farmers living on farms. Constantia is far from the city. I don't mind plots this big out here. But when you're within, within like walking distance of areas where there's a lot of work available for people and stuff like that, we really have to rethink our cities. I'm not popular for this. You know, the Martha don't like me because I say things like the urban, you know, the six-year-old suburban bungalow is an economically irrelevant thing, and it is. You know, I, the quaint Edwardian neighbourhoods that we have in our cities are great. You know these. How you know? Look at Boer Carp. Yay, we saved it. Um, but Lower Gravel and Durban. The houses are small. They're close together. They're straight, close to the road. They activate the street. Public can still live inside, outside. Public environments are safe. There's still low walls in those neighbourhoods. There's so many Brixton's like that in Joburg. Um, there's areas at like the bottom of gardens and stuff. When you drive around, there's a really nice feel. You know, those things are urban. But in Durban, 
there's pockets of that and the rest of it is just you know quarter acre plots houses in the middle half a front garden half a back garden what are you supposed to do that thing you know disconnected life go home you've got to build a country club if you're going to live you have swimming pool tennis club. you know that's what you have to have like nobody's sharing there's not shared po- it's not like going to the bars in Berlin and like you know okay the bars in Berlin are cool <laughs> <laughs> you know we don't have urbanity here it hasn't even started what are we going to do to bring it you know we're we just going to like pff, carry on out there into the wilderness I don't know but that's not what this is about I think if you're going to use CRT um, construction, we need to make it here. Don't I you think? Yeah. There's your guy. Yeah. Uh, started. Somebody yeah. started. Yeah, um, yeah. I don't know what the prices are relatively. Oh, he's really expensive. <laughs> 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 so for a single house, it's still more expensive. Well, I mean, you know, you've got to look at your, you know, this is why the building of it is so important. The modular, you know, your, for me, I can't control time on site. You know, I just, for the life of me, I'm, when I've done big projects, I built them in time and on budget, you know, like public buildings. For some, are they easier to do? But domestic work, hey, between the client and the builder, and the, it's just impossible. And I want to take that and, like, for me, modular prefabrication, your your return on investment, your time of build, your controllable P's and G's. That's what you've got to look for, you know. And like yeah. building it so damn quick, the client can't go, yeah. and the architect can't go. Hey, you know, I'll change it. Yeah, <laughs> you know we. It's just like, do it, design it, be, and be rigorous, you know, yeah. drawings are floppy. I look at drawings and I mean, what, you know, we don't detail up, you know, we're doing specialist buildings and they're not detailed. Mm-hmm. And the builder's making his mind up on site and the information isn't there. And, you know, for me, it's like, it, it, it just brings control. We, uh, I agree. But the next question then, if we do it here is, do we have the wood? Do we have the wood here? Yeah, I, I believe mean, they, we do. They're hey. running down our forests here. So, yeah, I mean, look, the forests are shrinking. Big problem. You know, the, 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 the timber guys are changing to mangoes and they're changing to, um, you know, so, uh, you know, our resources are shrinking. Michael, Michael will speak about that as well, you know. I'm, so, shrink, I'm not shrinking. No. <laughs> <laughs> but, we, but, yeah, but, so, but I think that CLT is the best possible thing for gum. Like, it's, everybody says, oh, gum's unstable. I've got, I've designed three meter high doors. That are that are over ten years old now, out of blue gum, not even Kamalda lenses, blue gum, and those things are straight because they're detailed properly. Yeah. And it's about layering, and knowing what a crown cut looks like, and you know, setting them up. And, and it, it, but CLT is the best thing for pine, South African pine, and it's the best thing for South African gum because it stabilizes them, because it takes out the risks you have with ill-placed yeah. knots. You know, and so in, and engineered woods are give us better results but it's it's capital intensive you know we need to make the investments so we need to build the market like Mikhail says he's completely happy to invest in a mill here if we can sell 50 homes a year you know because then you're producing enough is that enough is that the factor is it more homes 50 I mean the just to give you a figure the smaller CLT production they produce like 30 40 thousand cubes in a year and for one home, you need 20, 30 cubes. Yeah. So we What's talk about 40? thousand houses for a year. The house you're doing in Newlands? 45. 45 cubes, eh? Yeah. So, so it's, it's a, a thousand, all right. Yeah. So it's a thousand houses a year. Eh? Yeah. But <coughs> you can produce CLT in small scales as well. The yeah. problem is uh, the effectivity. Mm. Uh, you probably know very well what I'm speaking about it. You can do it in small scales, but, but sooner or later, uh, uh, you either must grow yourself in your production or you must accept that somebody who is bigger and more effective eats you. And the transport Charming. costs. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and you know, the transport costs from Europe to here, they are roughly, they are, they are underneath of the $3,000 a container. And a container is 40 and, to 50 and the carbon cubes. footprint of a container of a, on a ship from Europe is less than a truck from Durban to Joburg. Yeah. That's what I probably want to say. That, that they are not. I mean, uh, what, what is it? It's forty-five thousand rand, roughly forty thousand rand. How much is a truck from here to uh, uh, to, the, to the Eastern Cape? Yeah. No, I mean it's thirty grand. Uh, look. Yeah. You know, it's uh, so, so. We don't yeah. we don't talk about big big differences. Mm. We we just and 
and uh, everybody is like that. The economy is like that. They, they look for, for for resources which are effective. In the moment, there Especially will be somebody you're on scale. more effective on this market, uh, so nobody will import. Yeah. And but I think the opposite will happen if if we if we happen to have uh, to have more contracts here, more houses. So both will work. The local production, even small productions, will work, and the import will work as well. Yeah. And uh, uh, it's. Uh, I'm just so impressed by that he's here. You know that there is an open communication. Mm -hmm. That there is already, ev you know, even though, you know, even though it's potentially competitive, there's this attitude about well, we're all going to benefit. You know, over top have been great. I went to visit their factory last year. They're very free with their knowledge and they want to get it going. It's a great thing. <coughs> yeah, but there's a lot of, you know, you're sitting with a very well resolved resource that's available. And I've got to say, like, I've built timber frame buildings and it's as rife with as many problems as any other form of building. And if we're going to build effectively in this country, we have to think about, that, you know, and, and when we're dealing with problems where we actually need like massive amount of amenities brought into the marketplace, service delivery stuff, we've got to be thinking about not building them out of M150 blocks. You know, seriously. 